Okay, so all of our work so far has really just been to get quanta. So we've got the quanta there, and we we know their names, all that. But that's, that by itself is is pretty sterile. <coughs> if you look out the the window, you see light that's been emitted from the sun. It's been scattered off of stuff in the atmosphere. You see electrons that are bouncing around. They do things, and so it's the do things part that we're on to now is how how everything interacts with each other. And what you you'll come out of this being a able to read out of this section, the section on interactions. <coughs> you come out of it being able to take a Lagrangian and read it, to, to see through it. You know, this is what the I always say the high priest of physics could do. You, you give me a Lagrangian of the world and you know what's going to happen for, with that Lagrangian. We will still have some calculational stuff, but you'll end up having the Feynman rules. You know how to read off the Feynman rules. And today we start that process. Today, today we're going to do the real thing, electromagnetism, QED. And we're going to start reading off all the various matrix elements of things, you know, emitting photons, absorbing photons, splitting up it, photons splitting up into electron-positron pairs. That's our job today. Okay. So to start this off, we're just going to take electricity and magnetism. And we're using this field theory formalism, we're going to add take a charged particle and add E and M to it. And the rule is simple. You use the covariant derivative. The covariant derivative, any place you saw previously, so if you have a charged particle, any place you saw a derivative, you take that and replace it by the symbol D. The symbol D d mu is the usual derivative plus i times the charge on the particle times e mu. Okay? And that gives you e and m. So, let's do it. We have a scalar. The Lagrangian for a charged scalar is then d mu phi star d mu phi minus some, you know, some potential v of phi, m squared, phi squared, phi star phi, things like that. Okay. If we have the Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation, the Lagrangian for that is i over 2 phi star d0 psi Okay, so that's just a timepiece minus d0 psi star. It's actually everything starred psi minus d psi d psi. That's it. One was starred, the other is not, over 2m. Okay, and that, that's the Schrodinger Lagrangian. The Dirac case, the Lagrangian is written as psi bar i d slash minus m. So, okay, so we of course have to tell you what that is. All I've done is I've taken my usual ones and everywhere I had a derivative, I, I take the, the partial derivative symbol and replace it by capital D. Okay, so first the question is why. Okay, so the the answer to the question why is gauge invariance. Okay, the gauge invariance is a property of electricity and magnetism, and In, for the electromagnetic fields, it's the substitution of a mu goes to a mu prime, which is the, the original a mu plus the derivative 
of any, actually it's not an A, that's a lambda, I use lambda, of x and t. So any scalar function of, of x and t, and that leaves the field strength unchanged. So f mu nu prime is f mu nu. Okay. So people have been through the ENM course with me, did that <coughs> in relativistic notation. For charged particles, this is sus this is increased by a, a transformation on these fields also. So phi goes to phi prime, uh, which is e to the i. Let's see, I want a minus i q lambda of x and t phi. So you're changing the field by a phase, but that phase can be anything different at each point in space and time. So it can change depending where you are. Okay. Now, this, this of course leaves phi star phi as invariant. But because there's space-time variation in, in that, it doesn't leave derivatives invariant. But it does leave covariant derivatives invariant. So if you take, here, here's the proof. If you look at d, d mu phi, okay, that would go to d, d mu prime phi prime. So we transform both A that sits in the covariant derivative and phi prime. So let's write out what that is. <coughs> and that's d mu, okay, let's pull up the covariant derivative again. That's not going to be on the same page. So remember that, that guy there. Okay, I'm basically going to write A prime here. A prime is sitting down there. Okay, so d mu plus i q a prime is a mu plus d mu lambda acting on e to the minus i q lambda phi. Okay? So, what we, now, now I'm going to do is I'm going to allow this derivative to act on the lambda or the phi. In either case, I get back the exponential. So let's pull that out in front. E to the minus i q lambda. I get d mu minus i q derivative of lambda, that's lambda, sorry, from acting on the exponent. This, this the derivative there just acts on the phi. And then it's plus i q a mu plus d mu lambda. And things have been chosen, of course, such that the all the lambda dependence cancels out. And so this is covariant in the sense that it transforms the same way as phi does. Okay. So this then implies that anything that's that's looked like phi star d mu phi is invariant, okay, or d mu phi star d mu phi is invariant, okay. So if you, if you make this construction, you have this combined symmetry here, okay. Yes? Q is the charge on the particle, whatever the charge is, okay. So, so well, you can do it either of two ways. Okay, here's so let's yes, this is basically if you 
don't if the particle doesn't carry a charge, you don't you don't have the symmetry, or it doesn't have a this thing doesn't occur. I mean, you can do it either way. I could absorb Q into lambda. I could just call call that B, e to the i Q B, and then this would have one over Q in it when, when I did this transformation right here. Okay, it would be B over Q. So sometimes you see it written that way. Okay, um, but the the feature that is important is that the tr the thing that sits here in the covariant derivative is the charge of the particle, because we're going to see that this gives an elect electromagnetic current of a particle with charge Q. Okay, so if it's the electron, you want that to be electric charge. Okay, so this guy is the is the important Q sits right there, and and that part is it can't be ch changed. That's not a This, this invariance also would be the same invariance if, if I was using the symbol psi. So if I'm doing the, <coughs> the Schrodinger equation or the Dirac equation, you see that any of these guys, this, if I did the same symmetry here or here, calling it phi or psi doesn't make any difference. You just use the same covariant derivative no matter what the symbol is. Okay. This, the fact that this is the invariance also tells you that you, you did need to use the complex scalar field to describe the charged particles. That's, that turns out to be, so phi up here is a really a complex scalar. You can use a real scalar for an uncharged particle, but a complex scalar is needed for the charge. And that tied in nicely with the fact that charged particles come with antiparticles. Remember, this complex scalar came with an antiparticle, particle antiparticle combination. Real scalars are their own antiparticles, so they don't they don't necessarily need one. Yes. So we just say, well, we want kind of the yes. Of yes. Yes. Yeah. So in, in reality, what we've found historically, you know, through all this work starting with Maxwell, well, even before Maxwell, is that the theory is ha of E&M has a gauge invariance to it. And this is just promoting that to a the starting point. In the sense we've discovered gauge invariance is the, the principle that, that governs E&M. And so we're using this now to construct any Lagrangian that we want for a charged particle. So we've you know, it started experimentally, but this is our description now. Okay, so we have to figure out how to read this thing now. What what does come out of these guys is the electromagnetic currents. So mm -hmm. let's let's do that for the moment. In practice, actually, I should have always added not only the scalar interaction, but there's a photon piece also, the, the Lagrangian for the photon, which we did before, we would always add to this also. So let's let's do it. So let's look at the, the current, the electromagnetic current. Okay. So again, from E and M, you may or may not remember that the electromagnetic current is enters a Lagrangian as a mu j mu. Okay, so remember j mu is a four vector. The current is a four vector. The electromagnetic current has a charge density and a current density. That forms a four vector. A forms a four vector. The phi and a vector, the vector potential, and they enter the Lagrangian this way. And in a way, you can see that just by looking at the equations that come out. So if we do the Euler-Lagrange equations, you take the derivative L with respect to d mu a nu. That turns it that's minus f mu nu. I'm not redoing that. That we did 
before. It was a little bit painful, but that's what we had. The now there's a, a variation of the Lagrangian with respect to a nu itself is minus j nu. And so the the equations of motion then are d mu f mu nu equals j nu, which is Maxwell. Maxwell's equations in the presence of a current. Back, people who remember from the e &M class, when we did it there, it was a 4 pi, because we were using Gaussian units, but here we, there's no 4 pi. Okay, so this then tells us that if we write out a Lagrangian, we should be able to identify the electromagnetic current. And the way you do it is you take a look what couple up to A mu. So you just look A mu, J mu is the electromagnetic current. So if we write out, for example, let's do the scalar case. We write the Lagrangian is that's minus a quarter half mu nu mu nu, and then we have the scalar d mu phi star d mu phi minus some v of phi star phi, some other stuff that doesn't have derivatives in it. So in this guy, this, this is going to have something that goes like a mu minus a mu j mu plus there's actually some something else also there if i if i look at i'll actually just let's, let me just write out what it is just to complete things it's q a mu a mu phi star phi okay let, but let's let me just do this for you Let's look at the d mu phi star d mu phi. Okay, that has then well, it's d mu plus uh, no d d mu minus i q a mu phi star d mu plus i q a mu Okay, so that's that's writing out d mu phi star d mu phi, and then the pieces that you can pull out are, well, there's the the the, the usual piece, the kinetic energy piece, the usual stuff, the d mu phi star d mu phi. The next piece is the is the current piece. So it's let's take this a first. So it's, let's pull out a minus i q a mu. <coughs> then here it sits. So here's minus i q a mu d mu phi, and then this one. I put out a minus IQ, so here's a plus IQ. So there's a minus sign associated with the derivative on the other guy. So it's, you know, let's write it this way. It's phi star d mu phi, the derivative acting that way, minus uh, phi star with the derivative acting that way, phi. And then the last term was that q squared a mu a mu phi star phi. Okay, this last guy here we will treat as an interaction we'll do when we do perturbation theory. Um, but for here we get j mu e and m is then IQ 
Phi star D mu phi minus D mu phi star phi. Okay. Content. Okay. Now this this guy I wrote down for you once before. This was the aside from this charge is so this is equal to Q times the current that I used before, the particle current. Okay, so it's just charge times that. And we worked out what that was, but so let's, if we calculate the electromagnetic charge operator, it's the integral d3 x j0 e and m. It's what we did before, it's the integral d3 p over 2 pi cubed q times a dagger of p a of p minus b dagger of p b of p. Okay, so it's just what we had before. The particles have one charge, the antiparticles have the opposite charge. And, th and now it's really the electric charge. We also showed that d mu, j mu, we showed that before. And at that stage, I just called it a current, and I showed you it was conserved. It's just the equations of motion for the scalar field. So there, there's the electromagnetic current for a scalar particle. Um, okay, we're going to come back and take matrix sums of this, but let me let me do the same thing for the non-relativistic case. Okay, so non-relativistic, we have the Lagrangian is minus a quarter f nu f nu plus i over 2, psi star i d0 psi minus d0 psi star psi minus d psi of d, so one of those is star, d psi over 2m. Okay, and we can read out various things there. There's, there's, there starts off with all the free field stuff. You know, so the, the photon piece and the free Schrodinger Lagrangian piece. And then we're looking at, at various things that sit here. So this guy has time derivative plus I Q a zero. Okay. So that's that's there, and so um, yeah, actually, let's see. Watch out! I've got I've got two. This I is wrong. Be a little bit careful. There was a. And the, that one half goes past all of them there. Okay, you want to go back up and make that change. There's no i there. There's one i in front here, so it's i i times time derivative. It's what we had before. And it's a half on one side and minus a half going the other way. Okay, so this piece comes out. The piece that we're looking at with the a zero comes out as the minus q a zero psi star psi, okay, and you get one term from here, one half from here, and you get the other half from here, because when I compass conjugate that, I change its sign and, and they add, they don't cancel. Okay, then the next piece comes 
here. Okay, so we're going to look at the a a vector piece. There's an a vector piece here and an a vector piece there. So let's let me let me write out what it is, and we'll see if we can get it there. So there's an iq a vector, and then it's um, del phi star times phi and minus the opposite sign del no no phi star del phi and this is over 2m and then the left piece is um, minus Q a mu a, a vector a vector psi star psi. Okay. Well, this guy again is some in interaction piece which we'll treat separately. But we can pull out the current now. The current J mu E and M for this current is Q times the time component is psi star psi and then the spatial component is 1 over 2m it's psi star minus i del acting that way plus i del acting that away backwards psi Okay, and beautifully enough, this comes out as then what you see in the first case, the phi star psi is it clearly, Q psi star psi is the charge density of, of the, the Fermi, or the Schrodinger field, right? That's, that's, the, that's the particle density times Q is the charge density. So if you have a charge particle, that's, the, that's of course the charge density. And the current density, what you see sitting there, is this is the Hermitian form of P. Minus I del is P. And then this is the Hermitian form, it's just fact either way. So what this is, is this is P, uh, psi star, psi star, sorry, P over M psi. So psi star v non-relativistically v v, but p over p is the right variable to be using, p over m, and so that's exactly what you would think of the non-relativistic electromagnetic current. Okay, question? It's, it's sort of cute here. We've we've got it working out this way. Um, I should say that the, the Hamiltonian com, comes out as integral d3x psi star. Well, it's this covariant derivative um, d squared over 2m plus q a0, so q phi, phi. So if we, you know, I, I'm not going to do it for you, but if you if you do the usual rules, you take the, um, calculate the canonical momentum and transform and all that. Here's what the Hamiltonian comes out to be. It's, it's the covariant derivative squared plus q, q phi. That's also exactly what you'd expect. That's what you, you always use in quantum mechanics. Okay, and this piece sits there. I'm not doing it for you, yes. So the time derivative drops out. So, okay, um, the, what happens? Here, here's what happens. Let's, let's just mentally go through it. If you take the variation 
you calculate pi. Pi is the variation with respect to d0 psi, for example. That has this phi. And then when you take pi phi dot, phi star dot, minus L, the linear pieces just drop out. Okay? So if you, you can do it. It's just good good fun. So there is no time piece, that's the Hamilton. So exactly what you'd expect. Okay. This this current is conserved. Uh, let's not bother with it. It's basically if you if you act on this with time derivatives, you know, so you take the time derivative of this piece and the space derivative of this piece, this piece turns into I D by D T and this one turns into del squared over two M factors and they just miraculously equal the Schrodinger equation, so it's conserved. So the the time derivatives cancel the d squared del squared over two M pieces and we're done. Okay, so that's, again, works beautifully. And the last one, the Dirac field, let me just keep it here. You know, the Lagrangian number was psi bar i d slash minus m psi. The derivative here, the covariant derivative is a, so it's easy to pick out that the electromagnetic current is J mu E and M is Q psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay, so that's that's the current. Okay. Again. We showed this was conserved back when I first did the Dirac equation just by using the Dirac equation on this. We didn't have the fact of the charge out in front, but again, it gave the particle antiparticle nature, et cetera. So particles and antiparticles carry opposite electric charge. All right, any questions about that? So there's how we identify the charge. Um, now, what does it do? Okay, so here's here's the part where we start reading this. So let me take the, the scalar piece as an example. I've got J mu A mu is now this charge, it's phi star i d mu phi minus i d mu phi star phi a mu. Okay, well, remember back we, we quantized these things. So in phi there's a A and there's a B dagger. A annihilates the particle, B creates an antiparticle. Phi star has the reverse. Phi star has a dagger and a B. And this, the electromagnetic field, also has creation and annihilation operators. Um, let's put a subscript on a gamma to keep it distinct from the scalar. So it contains an annihilation operator and a creation operator. So quantum mechanically, this gives us a bunch of transitions. If, for example, if we started with a scalar coming in, With some momentum, for example, it can it can go out as some different momentum and emit a photon. Okay. So this is the transition where you create a photon out of some interaction. This this guy comes in, emits a photon, 
out goes something else. This is just an isolation. It's not yet a full calculation yet, but this is what the, the process does. Or you could do the following. Here's something else that you can happen. You can see you could have a photon coming in, and you get rid of it totally. So you re remove the photon, and you use the creation operators here. This guy creates a particle. This guy creates the antiparticle. And so you end up going to a particle-antiparticle pair outgoing. Okay, and there's, you can you can then sort of start doing all the permutations there. There could be particles coming in, antiparticles coming in. The reverse, you could have particles, antiparticles annihilating into photons. All those are contained in this part of the Lagrangian here. So it does all these things. And when we, when we get to Feynman rules, we'll draw Feynman rules that, that give all these things. So let's just look at some of these. Let's look at the current first. Okay. Well, <coughs> if I take just the JMU piece there, I can start with some particle of momentum P1 and make a transition to some particle of momentum P2. Okay. So our goal is right now is to calculate that. What's that number? That's a, just a number. Now, the, the answer is going to come out to be really simple. Unfortunately, we have to go through a, a little song and a dance to get there. So you can believe me that all the features are, are correct. And that song and dance, what we do is we plug in the expansions for phi and phi star in terms of the creation operators and the exponents and the integrals over p and all that stuff. And we let these annihilation operators act on this, this state here. We know what that state is. And read off the answer. OK, so let's, let's, let's do that. So here's what we have to do. Let me start it down here. It's a big, long one. OK. And I'll start over here. The initial state is gotten by A of P1, A dagger of P1 acting on the empty state. Okay. Then let's then I have a phi. So I have either the derivative on phi or phi itself. Let me just write phi, and then I'll put the derivatives next. So sitting over here, then, is the integral d3p, 2 pi cubed, 1 over the square root of 2 omega, e to the minus i, p dot x, a of p, Okay, and then there's another piece there with the B's in it, but the, I don't need the B's for this calculation. So let's just write that guy. Okay, so there was an e to the plus i p dot x b, but b isn't isn't going to do anything here. Okay, now the current part uh, I would I'd write as i q d mu left and right. Right, so up up here, that guy is is I Q phi star d mu left minus right. Uh, get it up there. Phi d mu. Okay, so that that gets going to be sitting there. I'll do, do take care of that in a minute. Then I have another. Field with this. So this is integral d3 p prime over 2 pi cubed. I have 1 over 2 omega prime square rooted. Here, this is 5 star now, so it's 
e to the plus i p prime dot x a dagger of p prime plus dot 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 which is the other guys lastly I have this the final state the final state is uh, 0 a of p 2 okay so if you take the initial state your Hermitian conjugated becomes a Okay, everyone comfortable with, with all those factors there. All right. So a couple of things. First, first, let's see. we've got p's and p primes. This guy and this guy have to. This, this a dagger has to annihilate that a. I mean, this a has to annihilate that a, a dagger. Remember, A acting on the on the empty state is is zero. So the way you, way you calculate it, I'll do it one more time, and then I'll stop doing this. Is when you when you see that function there, you write this as A of P commuted with a dagger of P plus the reverse order A dagger of Oh, so let's see, one of them is P1, A dagger P1, A of P, acting on the empty state, right? So you write it as the commutator, um, and this term, this, this last term here gives zero because that's, that always happens. And th this, the commutator gives two pi cubed, delta 3 of p minus p1. Okay. And so that's what it is. So from now on, from now on I'm never going to do this. I'll, tr I'll try not to ever do this, this, this again. Uh, what you do is you just say this has to annihilate that. It gives me 2 pi cubed delta, delta 3. Okay. So and you'll often just draw it like that to show that that annihilates. Okay. Same thing happens over here. And this time I'll just do it there. So there's that. So now the integrals over p and p prime are gone because the delta f of the delta functions. I end up with some numbers. The derivatives now the derivative when it acts here brings down a p, here it brings down a p prime. This turns this, the derivatives turn into, let's see, i, so it's q times p1 plus p2. Okay, so the i's and the minus i's that goes away. It's just Q times P. P is P is equal to P1. Here, there was a minus sign from the, the derivative acting the other way. And there's an extra change in sign there. It's the same same result. P plus P1. Okay. So this ends up being one over square root of two omega one, two omega two. Those factors remain Q P1 plus p2 mu e to the minus i p1 minus p2 dot x. Okay. And we'll, before the end of the class, we'll codify the, that reading there. Okay. Um, Let's see, I'm sorry, this exponential right here? Oh, this thing sitting up here? Okay, that's what this derivative is turned into. That's not an exponent. That's, that's this derivative right there. When I act with a derivative in this direction, I bring down a factor of p, because it's d by dx. 
so it becomes P. And P has become P1. So the P1 there is from the derivative acting in this direction. When the derivative acts this direction, there's a minus sign associated when I do left minus right. There's also a change on minus i to plus i. So the derivative acting that way brings down p prime, which is equal to p2. Okay? Yeah, yes, the mu component of that. That's right. So we're taking the we're taking the mu component of j between these. Oh, y is upper versus lower. Sorry, it's lower. Good. Thank you. Yes. Yes. It seems I don't pay any attention to that. So let's lower that guy too. Then you can tell how important people who do the, do this for a living feel feel about that. We just don't pay attention. Sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. Okay. So there, there we go. Now, this this actually looks a little fancy to you, but it actually it's not that fancy. It's 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 good news. Let's let's to make it seem more obvious. Let's take p1 goes to p2 p2. So in other words, it's just it's not changing momentum, it's just going straight forward, okay? Then this matrix element that we have here, J mu, is, well, <coughs> the omega 1, omega 2 work the same, P1 and P2 are the same, so the 2s are going to cancel, so this is just Q T mu over E. Okay, so that's Q, P0 is E, so the first component is 1, and the second component is P over E. Okay, P over E is the relativistic velocity. So there's, that's all this matrix element is, is it's the time component, the time component is the charge, the spatial component is the velocity times the charge. Okay, so it's, but we've we've gotten a good deal more out of it. Also, if we have a transition where you you change your momentum, we know how the how the current changes. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the first part of it. So there's the current. Now let's do the whole Lagrangian. Now let's do L interaction is minus j mu a mu. So now we're doing the whole thing. And we're going to do a real transition. We're going to take some amplitude, which is a particle with p2 going out, a, a photon with momentum, let's call it q, the interaction Lagrangian and a particle of momentum P1 in. Okay, so this is the thing that we drew above as the picture P1, P2, Q. Okay, well, this is just minus J mu, A mu, so we've done We've done the all the stuff with J's. Phi, phi, J contains phi, so all that stuff we've done. All we have is the A left to do. And you can sort of see from what we did there is there's this gets written as the integral over some Q prime with an E to the I Q and an A dagger of Q prime and all that stuff and we we Contract that. Let me just write the answer and see if it's, if that's sufficient for you. Okay. We get from the the currents that we already did. We get one over the square root of two omega one, two omega two. There's also 
uh, square root of 2 omega q from the photon piece. Okay. That was sitting there in the photon field. The, just like before, we get p1 plus p2 mu. What's left over from the photon is epsilon star mu. And then in the exponent, we have e. Well, we have e to the minus i p1 minus p2. Now it's minus q dot x. Okay. And all this comes from the, the piece. You can sort of see it. It's the integral d3 q prime over 2 pi cubed. Um, I want I want the a dagger piece. I want the da, 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 plus e to the i q dot x q prime dot x a dagger of q prime epsilon star okay. so that's where it all came from, and there was the the normalization factor one over that we had before. Okay? So you this guy creates that photon from the final state. So that's equal sets equal to Q. E the IQ that X sits there, epsilon Q sits there. There's our matrix one. Yes? Is the Q um, in front of the ah. charge? That's the charge, yes. So yeah, it's good yeah, bad bad notation, but yes, this this guy is let's call it the electric charge. Okay. All right. So let's let's do a couple other ones. Um, we'll try to do these a little quicker now, just to see. But another one that we could have done is we could have done we could have done phi bar of P2 J mu phi bar of P1. So here it's the same thing, but the particles are coming in. This is the antiparticles coming in P1, antiparticles coming in P2. Okay. Well, so we have to go up here to this calculation again. And now I'm going to I'm going to do the the same sort of thing except I'm going to write out the other piece. And if you let me do it quickly, then we'll we'll see it. I'm going to write a B dagger here because it's the antiparticle. I'm going to write the the B and B dagger pieces that are associated with these guys. This is going to be the same, and that's going to be a B dagger. All right. So let's. let's see. I'm just going to start writing away, and you can stop me if you have trouble. So it's going to be 0, b of p, 2, integral d for p prime over 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 omega q prime, dot, 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 plus here is e to the minus i p2 dot x b of p prime i q d mu left and right and over here I had integral d 3 p 2 pi cubed 1 over square root of 2 omega from that blah 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 plus e to the plus i p dot x b dagger of p and then here is b dagger of p one zero. Okay, I have one typo in that. I have one printo. Anyone see my pr printed mistake? 
P2 is good, good. He's paying attention. There we go. That should be primed. All right. Okay. So this is essentially the same thing except it's the other pieces. We had the A pieces here. Now it's the B dagger pieces. There was an A dagger piece here. Now it's a B. <laughs> the purpose of doing this is that, again, it's a little bit painful, but now these actually play a slightly different role here. Previously, we had the A piece here annihilated the A dagger there. Here, actually, it comes off from this side over here. This B has to annihilate that, that B dagger. So those go disappear. So P prime becomes P. The, the other two go this one here. That guy creates that one. So those two are tied together. Now, we still, so we still have e to the minus i p1 in the end. So p1 is coming in. Still e to the minus i p1. But now, because the derivative here had a minus sign when acting that way, the, the, this guy turns into minus q p1 plus p2. Okay, you can sort of see the other piece also. Here's, this guy becomes p2 i times the derivative gives me, with the i there, gives me a minus sign. So it turns to that. And so the net outcome of all of this work is that this current matrix element for the, for the antiparticles is minus q, the same thing, 2 omega 1, 2 omega 2, P1 plus P2, mu e to the minus i q dot x. Okay, so miraculously, the minus sign comes out there. The antiparticles carry charge minus q. And you know, when you when you do the calculation, it 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 looks like sort of a dumb part of the calculation, you know, the fact that the derivative is acting this way versus that way, there's an extra minus sign. It looks dumb, but it's actually smart. It's smarter than we are. It tells us that, you know, that this thing automatically comes with particles and the particles with opposite charge. You didn't have to know that ahead of time. If you take the matrix element, it comes out. John. Ah, uh, yes, uh, thank you, thank you, yes. Oh, that's a, Yes, yeah, much, much too simplistic. E to the minus i, p1 minus um, p2, plus p, no, e to p1 minus p2 dot x. Okay. So it's minus i, p1 from here, that's, this that guy should not have been p2. Um, that's, that's p1 because it's this guy and you know, plus I speak to Thanks, John. Okay. And if you added a photon, uh, I have, I, this is just the current. I, you add the photon, it's just like before. There's an epsilon or, or associated with it. Let me write one more, and then, then, then I'll start the summary. So one more. Let's do, let's do this matrix element here. I'll just write it. You can you can sort of see all the ingredients now. Let's start with it so it's a photon momentum Q coming in, P one, P two going out. And uh, sure, please. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Um, yeah, so, so th this is not yet a full matrix element. When we get, when we take full matrix elements, we're going to see that all these exponents uh, turn into conservation momentum. So for example, let's go back up here. 
this one here is a full matrix element. This, this isn't a photon. The other one was just the current matrix element. And here we have this. The rules that we'll eventually develop for Feynman rules have an integral over x. That will enforce conservation of momentum. Okay, so once you integrate over x, momentum will be be conserved. And then I just I, Feynman rules will not have this factor here, but it will have this factor here. Okay, so the x yeah, is a good place to foreshadow where we're headed. We're going to turn into to writing Feynman rules where these are the little building blocks. The matrix elements of the interaction Lagrangian or the interaction Hamiltonian are the things that make the system change. So all transitions get governed by the interaction pieces. The, the full part of the action is the integral over this, the integral d4x. That's going to enforce momentum conservation at each vertex. There's going to be a bunch of normalization factors which we'll just collect out in front. We'll just pull them in front. And then these terms like this are going to be your Feynman rules. Okay. That's what we're getting. We're, we're building up to reading out the overall Feynman rules um, by seeing what, what these interaction terms do. Okay. Let's, let's do this one last example, then I'll give you all the, the rules. Okay. So here, let's try taking this matrix element. So it's, it's a photon of momentum Q coming in. I want, um, let's J mu, A mu sitting there. And I want a particle momentum P1 coming out in antiparticle momentum P2. No, actually, let's... Uh, which is it that I want? I actually want particle momentum P2, antiparticle momentum P1. No, I don't. Let's go back and change that. I get to change it even easier than you do. Um, so phi is P1, and this is P2. Well, OK, well. You can sort of see the, the various factors that are guaranteed to be there. There's 1 over 2 omega 1, 2 omega 2, 1 over the square root of 2 omega q. From those normalization factors, those always end up there. There's e to the minus i q minus p1 minus p2 dot x. There's a factor of q times p1 minus p2 mu dot epsilon mu. Okay, and that's, that's why I had to get my p1s and p2s right because the it's 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 an odd function of p1 and p2. Okay, and you can sort of see all those pieces there. The the phi bar of P two pieces is exactly like we had before. So here's phi bar of P two. And if you have phi bar of P two, we had a minus I P two mi minus Q P two. And here's the minus QP2 from this guy. Um, and it's, it's the same calculation as up here. And the P1 piece, we had previously P1 plus P2. So it was always a plus Q with, with the five. Uh, so if you go up there and look at the piece of the calculation, you get the plus I P1, OK? So there's 
another one. And I, and I can do it in more detail if you want. But you can sort of guess that's the answer. So here's the rules. Okay. The anytime you have an initial state the initial state of particle antiparticle it doesn't matter you don't have to know what that is you write e to the minus i p dot x for that for some final state particle you write e to the plus i p dot x so that comes out there's, there's always one of the square root of two omega for any boson. So photons or scalars. It turns out, and we can we'll see this probably not today, um, that our normalization for the Dirac field. was one. And that's because there's actually a, if you want to trace back where it is, there's a square root of two, two E sitting in the denominator of the spinners in the normalization of that. That's where it lives. Three, there's an epsilon mu of, for a initial photon. And epsilon star mu for a final. And this just came because epsilon sits on the cr annihilation operators, so it annihilates something in the initial state. Epsilon star sits with the creation operators to create something in the final state. The anytime you see a derivative, depending on what it acts on, if the derivative acts on something in the initial state. It's minus i p mu for initial state. And plus i p mu for final. OK, and that just follows from rule number one. Derivatives act on that. In with a current, you add a, a, a factor of Q. And so it's, you know, it's Q of whatever the field is. So that's equal to plus Q for the particles minus Q for the anti. That's under the naming convention that the Q is defined with the particle name. Okay, and then the last thing that we will do um, six is for Dirac particles. Okay, We're, I haven't done this yet. That comes. That's yes. That's my next thing to do. So let's. But it's going to not be today. <clears throat> so any incoming particle, you write u of p. Okay. For an outgoing particle, you, you write u bar of p. Okay. That that sort of obvious, size and side bars. However, this the following thing is needs a little work. Um, you write V bar of P for an incoming antiparticle. Okay, and that's a bit of a surprise. It's not V, it's V bar. And you write V of P for an outgoing. OK. 
Okay. So these, the, the, there's, there's a little bit of a surprise. Um, and we'll show why that happens last time. But let's just write an example. If I wanted to do the same thing, fermion, anti-fermion, a photon. Okay. The amplitude for that guy is, well, I have 1 over the square root of 2 omega q for the photon. The nor fermion normalizations are 1, so 1 times 1 from that. I get e to the minus i q minus p1 minus p2 dot x. Yeah. I have I have epsilon mu of Q for the photon. And the last piece, the piece I have to work out next time, is U bar of P P one, P two, P one gamma mu V of P two. Okay, so by our rules, this is this is outgoing fermion. This this is this is the outgoing anti-fermion outgoing. So that's what we have there, and the gamma mu comes because the current was psi bar gamma mu psi. Okay, so we'll, and I forgot my factor of the charge Q, and I but I think that's it. Okay, so next time we do that, and then we we do a few other interactions, and we start then piecing things together. Okay. Good, great. So you're starting to become one of the high priests, you know, start to know how to read these Lagrangians. You, I give you a Lagrangian, you, you can write out matrix elements. Okay, good, we'll see you. Oh. I won't see you on Tuesday. Tuesday is a Monday. So we, I see you next Thursday. That's also why your homework's due on Thursday. It's Tuesday is a Monday.